Patients began showing up in emergency rooms last spring, at first in Wisconsin and Illinois. Young men struggling in vain to suck air into their lungs. They've been in the hospital for three, four, five days. They know they've been very sick. Some of them thought they would die. At first glance, their symptoms resembled severe pneumonia, but there was no infection or virus to blame. Eventually, this mystery illness would trail back to the one thing they all had in common. We are joined today by CDC's Principal Deputy Director, Dr. Ann Shilkett, who will provide this week's update. We can conclude that what I call the explosive outbreak of cases of Evali, e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury can be attributed to exposure to THC containing vaping products that also contain vitamin E acetate. I want to stress that this does not mean that there are not other substances in e-cigarette or vaping products that are capable of causing lung injury. Welcome to the Healthy You podcast from North Shore University Health System, where we explore trending topics in healthcare. In today's episode, we dive into the frightening vaping epidemic that sickened more than 2,500 people and killed 60. I'm Carolyn Starks. Vitamin E acetate is an oily, sticky chemical that black market cannabis suppliers added to THC vaping liquids to thicken or dilute them. It is a synthetic form of vitamin E and is used safely in products like skin creams, but can be deadly when inhaled. THC is the main psychoactive compound found in marijuana that gives that high sensation. But before we go deeper into what happened last spring and continues till today, we realized that we really didn't have a good understanding what vaping was, the basics of it at least. So John Hillenbrand, our producer, and I decided to head out to a local smoke shop to find out more. And that's where we spoke with Patty. Hi. Hi. (laughs) I'm here with Patty at a local um, smoke shop, and she's explaining all the different products, uh, vaping products that they have here. We'll explain this. You have to get a pen and then your pods to go into the pen, correct? Yeah. You have to get the battery. It comes the battery and the charger itself. Uh, and then you would One of the things Patty told us was that if you've seen an e-cigarette device like a Juul, you've seen a vaporizer. Unlike traditional cigarettes that burn leaves to make smoke, these devices use batteries and small metal coils to heat up a liquid and create a vapor like aerosol, which is why these devices are referred to as vaporizers, and using them is often called vaping. So people can vape a wide range of things, including nicotine, flavorings, and cannabis products like THC and CBD made from the flowers or a concentrate but not so hot that they combust. Each pod is equivalent to about a pack of cigarettes. Um, 5% nicotine each one, and that's it. You buy your battery, take a pod, you uncap it, pop it into the battery. The little light flashes to let you know it's in there, and that's it. It's also dry activated, so you just take an inhale. And How long do you think it? a pod would last? For uh, a regular vapor, I would say two to three days. Okay. So that would be like a pack of cigarettes two to three yeah, days. Yeah, because it's a lot easier to vape this. You're not offending anybody. You don't have to go outside. You don't have to make it that ritual. You can just puff on it wherever you wherever you are, whenever. Right. Yeah, so it's easy to go through a pod faster. So what's this one here? Okay, so here we're looking at a Posh Plus. It's one of, you know, various disposable vape options. Pretty easy to use. You just pick it up it's nine dollars take off the packaging and it's draw activated so you just inhale to take the hit it this one here comes with two milliliters of juice -juice, e-juice at six percent strength nicotine so uh pretty high you know to be honest Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's very flavorful the flavoring pretty much covers the nicotine so it's not that harsh actually on your throat it's a nice smooth vapor Non-offensive. So what made these so popular among teens and young adults were the flavorants that were added to these e-cigarettes. Some of the chemicals used to flavor vape fluids like diacetyl have been linked to serious lung issues when inhaled. So as of February 1st this year, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is banning the manufacture and sale of flavored vaping products. 
This was one way the FDA could dramatically limit children's access to certain flavored e-cigarettes. However, they won't restrict sales of disposable e-cigarettes that come in flavors such as Cherry Crush, Watermelon, and Pineapple Lemonade. It doesn't leave a smell on your clothes or anything like that, so it is nice. You know, what especially... kind of flavors? What is that? This one here is a frozen mango flavor. Okay. Um, what and, other flavors? Yeah, they also have a pina colada, a fireball, tobacco menthol, minty melon, creme brulee, and the menthol ice. So menthol is pretty common. It's pretty popular additive, but... Yeah, quite a few flavors. Something for everyone. Um, uh, how long has the flavors been off the market? Our producer, John Hillenbrand. I mean, they're still out there because the ban is so recent. Uh, but we there has been talk for the past couple months, honestly. And so we've been ready. Are you expecting to see less kids in here? Or what do you, what do you think is going to be the long-term impact of no more flavors like, other than the disposables? I think just like when anything goes is prohibited, people find a way around it. I think because now the disposables are fine, they're just going to find a way to get to the disposables. I mean, people, they're, they're going to do what they're, they're going to do. So, so yeah, I think it, if anything, it'll, it will be more difficult, but now they've got the disposables and it's not an issue. It's not like a real ban. <laughs> Correct, yeah. <laughs> it's a loophole that they've found. Right. Hi, my name is Gerald Lakin. I'm Director of Medical Toxicology at North Shore University Health System Omega. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome, because, you know, I feel like this is going to be a roller coaster ride. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, for an audience who doesn't know Dr. Lakin, he is board certified in emergency medicine, internal medicine, medical toxicology, and addiction medicine. He has presented over 190 abstracts at national meetings, and has published over 200 articles in peer-reviewed medical journals. He is also the co-editor of the Poisoning and Toxicology Handbook and the American Medical Association Handbook for First Aid and Emergency Care. So your resume is like an encyclopedia of toxicology and addiction, emergency medicine. That's what I meant when I felt like I might be on a roller coaster ride. Like if I blink, I may miss something because you have so much encyclopedic knowledge. But that's why we have here. So I'm so glad you're here. The latest data from the CDC shows that vitamin E acetate, this oily kind of chemical that's added to some THC vaping liquids to thicken or dilute them, is seen as like a top reason for lung injury in vapors. It certainly appears that way, and it makes sense. Um, vitamin E acetate has about the same consistency as an oil as THC you know, or pure cannabis oil. So it's about the same consistency. When you use it in concentrated forms, mm -hmm. it can cause a burn. How is it used safely? Like in products or? It, well, or? It's, it's the uh, derivative of vitamin E in, in the sense it has been used in topical creams to some extent Okay. Um, in this way, but at relatively dilute concentrations. And so any medication, certainly in concentrated form, can cause toxicity. That's the definition of a toxin. It's a dose that makes the poison, so to speak. Okay. And so vitamin E, when taken either at a very high concentration or inhaled, because it can cause a direct damage to the lung. The lung is very sensitive to caustic substances or irritants. It's not like the skin, which has protective layers to it. Um, and even if it's put on the skin, vitamin E acetate can cause problems. But certainly when inhaled, and even more so when heated and inhaled, mm -hmm. uh, lung injury can and has occurred, and it can look similar to certain types of pneumonia called ARDS or respiratory distress syndrome or a chemical burn. So how does a vape pen work? There's a, usually a solvent such as propylene glycol or something along those lines that upon heating, I believe around 200 to 220 degrees, that makes the substance more water soluble, does not cause burning of the substance like smoking. So therefore, you're not getting carbon monoxide. Um, you're not getting benzene. You're not getting formaldehyde, <laughs> in theory. You know, you're not getting all these other chemicals, the tars and things like that, that you see with cigarette smoke that makes it so toxic. In, in that sense, it's, not, it's being water-soluble, it's less irritating to the lung. 
people don't, in theory, again, I'm saying in theory, won't be developing emphysema and, th- and those kind of lung diseases. Of course, in these cases, they were illicit. Illicit cannabis, yeah. yes. Yes. In fact, the cartridges that my patients gave me said solvent-free, which meant that they did not contain those substances. Yeah, but who's printing those labels? <laughs> the, the, the guys that are selling it illicitly, yeah. Take me through what happens when this oily substance, when you breathe it in, you, you take that first in- mm-hmm. inhalation. When taking a substance that can be of some irritant or caustic nature, and you're using it constantly, it causes almost like a burn um, to the lungs. And the individuals I've seen don't do this once. They're doing it multiple times a day, almost constantly, almost like chain smoking. And it causes essentially uh, what we call a whiteout of the lungs, which means that the lungs, which on x-ray normally look very dark with air in it, look white, are what we call opacified. Lungs normally should be very dark, very black. And here the lungs are almost all white on both sides, right and left. Some pneumonias are unilober, you know, unilateral or maybe a single lobe. This is multiple lobes. There is no really good oxygen exchange. One cannot exchange oxygen from the lungs to the blood if there are substances in between, if the lung is very inflamed or burned. So would vitamin E acetate be like this oily substance that can like stick to your lungs, for lack of a better word? or It can, it can stick to it. What they also found out, and there was a recent New England Journal article about it, mm-hmm. finding it in over 90% of individuals that had this syndrome, E-Valley syndrome, as it's called. E-Valley is an acronym for? For the uh, vaping injury, e-cigarette vaping lung injury. Right. Okay. Got it. And uh, they, so they found evidence of vitamin E acetate specifically in over 90% of these individuals. So is it the combination of this vitamin E acetate with the THC that's in some of these, or Pierce, is it they separately can do damage too? THC probably does not do much direct lung damage. This is probably all due to the vitamin E acetate. Okay. You said it's continued use. So from what I read was that you might might have a vapor who's having symptoms of pneumonia or severe respiratory illness at home for several days, then they come to the ED. Have you seen those patients? And what it, what yes, I've seen about of, half a dozen of them. Okay, so what are they experiencing symptom-wise? Um, for the most part, it's primarily uh, lung symptoms, shortness of breath, chest pain, pl- what we call pleuritic chest pain, meaning that the pain is worse when you breathe in deeply, coughing, not coughing blood, but mainly very hacking cough. There's quite a bit of GI signs and symptoms with these individuals. That is nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain. It, but it sounds like pneumonia. Well, it, it's, it's a very severe pneumonia. Would it be labeled pneumonia or no? Uh, at first, it might be. On the cases that I've seen, uh, first of all, one has to rule out uh, hypersensitivity. And so what I do is what's known as RAS serology. That is to make sure that they're not sensitive to certain chemicals like formaldehyde or isocyanates or something like that, that this is not an allergic response. And this does not appear to be an allergic response. Okay. So that's, num- that's, that's one thing. We often, we give antibiotics, but antibiotics have not been shown to be useful because there really is no primary infection. Okay, so you start antibiotics and they're not working, so that's right. a sign to you. Right, that- exactly. And the individual progresses. Then, you know, they're telling me they have a history of vaping cannabis. Okay. Everyone has right. told me that. Um, and I do a drug test. And in all the cases I've been involved with, the drug test shows that their cannabis level in their urine is too high to count. I mean, it's exceedingly high wow. um, o- overall. Um, the number is over 500 nanograms per milliliter in the urine, which is exceedingly high. After smoking one joint or vaping one time, your level will probably be 50 or 80 nanograms per milliliter in the urine. These individuals are over 500. And equate that to how much they're smoking before that test. There's, like there's, all there's day long, continual? All day long. Off and on, all day long. Almost, yeah. almost the entire time they're awake. Wow. Basically, with, with vaping, they're, get, they're vaping a gram of cannabis a day. 
That's a gram. Usually, when I was growing up, and I'm talking about the 1970s and even 60s, we're talking about each joint being, you know, maybe 20 milligrams or 30 milligrams in that ballpark. And this is a gram of cannabis a day. And so at some point, we'll be giving steroids, corticosteroids, which has been shown to be helpful, but not completely what we would call antidotal. In other words, it doesn't necessarily reverse it right away. So you have the testimony from the patient talking about that. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's another clue. And 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 family members. But you um, vaping's been around for a while, so this is something different. You're seeing. Yes. Um, so what do you see well, on the? Did, oh, I'm sorry. We did see it with hookahs. Oh, okay. We did see this very very rarely with hookahs and uh, other types of similar type of vaping substances. So is there anything else you do to confirm that this is E-Valley? Well, we, um, we believe that uh, if you have the urine level over 500, that confirms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the progression of the illness. Uh, antibiotics don't appear to help. The white blood cell count is elevated, but not severely elevated. These are young individuals. Yeah. And so... If there's symptoms such as the GI symptoms, the, the nausea, the vomiting, abdominal pain, usually dissipate over a few days. But the, the uh, lung problems may stay the same or even get worse in the hospital for a week or so. Then, then it's pretty obvious. And plus, all our other infectious disease monitors, such as cultures, sputum cultures, blood cultures, viral titers, they're all negative. Do you also get something from the lungs? It's called bronchovelar lavage, BAL. That's essentially washing out the lungs and looking at the fluid, looking at the cells. For example, if there are quite a few eosinophils, that in- indicates an allergic response. That's not what's happening here. Right. Um, what what ha- do you see here then? What, he- what we saw here was known as uh, lipid fill- filled macrophages. Um, in other words, they stain a particular way that looks like a, what's called a lipoid pneumonia. Um, one had seen it classically with mineral oil aspiration. In other words, when someone uh, either drinks mineral oil or whatever and gets in their lung, right. that causes a lipoid pneumonia. Um, and that's what this was thought to be, actually, since a very high percentage of these individuals had the staining of the macrophages. But it turns out that the staining of the macrophages can occur in other types of pneumonia or this type of instance. Is it affecting any other part of their body? Well, as, as I mentioned, it does cause nausea and vomiting, right. but I'm thinking that may be due to too much cannabis. You can get nausea and vomiting and down pain just, just from smoking cannabis too much. Right. So I'm thinking that's not due to the pathology of the lungs, but t- due to the cannabis ingestion or intake. So that, that goes away pretty fast. There does not appear, other than lungs, there does not appear to be any residual effects. I mean, there's no pancreas effects, no liver effects, no kidney effects. Um, we haven't seen any abnormalities at, at that. These patients are not seizing. They're very alert. They're, the lung damage can be considerable. and Could that be permanent? It could be chronic. I can't say whether it's permanent. Okay. Usually, usually there is marked improvement. I would think that there would be a high risk of reusing once they leave, even though they've been through a hospital crisis, health crisis like this. Well, we send these patients to addiction medicine. um, And every one of the patients that I've seen, but I've only seen them in the hospital, Mm -hmm. have told me they're never going to use it again. So, you know. Well, you're an addiction specialist, too. So what what do you think about even that statement? It can't. It's not for certain. It's not for certain. Um, the problem with cannabis addiction is there's no FDA-approved drug to treat cannabis addiction. There's multiple for narcotics. There's multiple for alcohol um, overall. But there is no drug for cannabis that's FDA-approved. There's no drug that's really been shown to be helpful for cannabis addiction. Mm-hmm. That's part of the problem that we have with these, you know, uh, legalization of marijuana is that we don't have a recognized therapy for a person to get off uh, cannabis addiction. And these, all these uh, patients that I've seen are addicted to cannabis. And they admit it, right? Yes. They feel like, yes, I am an addict. Uh, some of them have gone into withdrawal. And what, what does that look like? That looks like a very minor opiate withdrawal. In other words, they, they're sweating quite a bit. They feel what we call dysphoric. 
They don't feel happy. They feel sad, depressed, anxious. Their heart rates may be somewhat elevated. There may be some loose stools at the time. It usually lasts for about four or five days. What have your conversations with them been like? Well, it's all, it's all pretty much the same. I, I tell them what I said here, that uh, I, th- I believe that it's, it's due to the cannabis vaping. We thought it was another substance. In the early 2000s, there was a similar outbreak with microwave popcorn, people right. that uh, made microwave popcorn. Um, and uh, this solvent was used as a buttering agent. It wasn't butter. It was a buttering agent. <laughs> right. And uh, the workers breathed it in and developed what's known as popcorn lung, which was looked like just like this. In fact, in my first patients, I, I told them I thought this was popcorn lung. Wow, that's interesting. It's pretty much almost the same thing. Um, a, a different substance, but pretty much the same same uh, Because pathology. it's the same consistency? Same, same damage to the lungs. Oh, okay. But is that popcorn lining that you're talking about the fake chemical mm-hmm. popcorn that they put on the lining of the bags? Of yes. popcorn bags that you put in yeah. the microwave and yes. but they're making it. They're they're ones applying this was the, the chemical. Workers. These yeah. were the workers. Okay. Gotcha. Who were exposed to a heck of a lot of this. Oh right. Um, without any uh, protection. And so they were breathing this in all day. And so that that's that was identified and it's pretty much stops over the last fifteen years or so. So what has been the reaction? I know you have the conversation with the patients. What has their reaction been when you have to have this kind of frank conversation with them? Acceptance. Um, I mean, by now, they've been in the hospital for three, four, five days. They know they've been very sick. Yeah. Some of them thought they would die. And so it is a moment that they're acceptable that. Now, whether it lasts for several months is another question. I sit down with them and their families. And I go over everything that we were just talking about, actually, that this is a substance, uh, that this is addiction. They, they need help. We're here to help them mm-hmm. as far as that essentially they're over the worst part of the addiction. But couldn't some of them feel like, OK, well, um, I, I'll, I won't get any with the vitamin E acetate in it and I'll be fine. Yeah, but they don't know. It doesn't say vitamin E acetate on the cartridge. Um, these are illicit cartridges. Right. But now I, they can get it legally. <laughs> now, they, the, oh. now they can get it legally, although I don't know the status of the uh, vaping o- overall. Most, most of what they're getting legally is the actual plant and not, uh, not some of the oils or things like that. They are getting some of the oils, but it's not as readily available. But there's no way to check whether the legally obtained vaping is what's mm-hmm. in it, right? Or I'll is go there? one step further. There's no quality control on any of these legal cannabis. I mean, they, they can contain pesticides. They can contain herbicides. In 2008, they had 150 cases of lead poisoning in Germany from it. Um, so there is that's the problem with the cannabis is there is no quality control. You go to the CVS or Walgreens and you buy uh, some ibuprofen off the counter and it says 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. It's 200 milligrams. Right. It's not 205 or 206, and there's no contaminants in there. Right. Drug companies use immense and intense quality control measures to make sure what the consumer is getting is right there on the label. With cannabis, there is no quality control from anybody. So that's, that is the problem. Uh, it is the Wild West. It's like supplements. How does that compare to alcohol and quality control for alcohol? And- alcohol, and even tobacco to a certain extent, does have quite a bit of quality control measures. For example, if it says beer is 4.3% alcohol, it's 4.3%. And so there, there is immense quality control measures with alcohol that's bought legally. I'm not talking moonshine. <laughs> and it's a, which may contain methyl alcohol right? <laughs> um, o- overall. But the stuff that you get in the liquor store... Um, you could be pretty well assured there is quality control behind it. You cannot be assured when you buy cannabis from anybody, legal or illegal, that there's any quality control. And to us in pharmacology and toxicology, quality control is the thing. We're very fastidious about medicines, being very precise to making sure that there is absolutely, positively no contamination in this way. And no one can say this with buying cannabis. So we got moonshine in the podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> they had a, they had a uh, uh, mash episode the other day. I was watching, and Hawkeye built his uh, still, 
And the yes. first thing he said, you know, to the person drinking, he says, and you won't go blind from it. <laughs> so Hawkeye knows that you decant off the top 10 percent so you, you get rid of the methyl alcohol. <laughs> we would never know the backstory of that joke. <laughs> so some people say vaping is the healthy alternative to smoking and a way to quit. And what are your feelings about that? It's possible. Um, I, 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 I would not use it as a way to s- someone stop smoking or anything like that. But in theory, it is possible. With vaping, you're not burning substances. There's no combustion. So you don't develop all those byproducts of combustion in this sense. In theory, there is less lung damage. It, in theory, and the keyword being in theory, mm-hmm. it does not cause emphysema or asthma that uh, uh, other cigarettes can do. And so in theory, it's, these are water-soluble, and so that it does not cause any reactions in the lung. And it can deliver measured doses of nicotine that one can titrate down and get someone off. So in theory, I think the theory is there mm-hmm. in this sense. What I believe, and I, I suppose this is, I don't know if this has ever been proposed, but that maybe vaping should be done by prescription only. Only in, you know, with being monitored by a physician, that physician uh, believes that uh, the person can be use vaping to decrease smoking and the damage to the lungs. I don't know how often it's done in practice. I don't know how effective it would be. Um, but it sounds like it could it could be effective. It could be it, originally that was one of the points. Yeah, behind right, right vaping. Now, if someone has never smoked mm-hmm. and they have a choice between starting smoking a cigarette or starting to smoke, you know, a vaping pen, mm-hmm. or whatever, um, is there a higher risk of using a vaping pen because you're just getting a higher dose of nicotine? I think both. I, I, first of all, I think in a vulnerable population, and I can't say what's higher risk, I think they're both at high risk in, in this way, both either smoking or vaping, because you're dealing with uh, adolescent brain, which is not developed until age 25. And so from that aspect, I believe either one, I can't say one may be at slightly higher risk than the other, but in the overall scheme of things, they're both at high risk. Vaping gets you higher levels than smoking cannabis. Uh, I guess you higher levels probably of nicotine too. And so it is that aspect that I believe that uh, the consequences are far more deleterious with vaping than with smoking. I'm not ever, I'm not advocating smoking either <laughs> or, or anything along those lines. But uh, I believe that uh, vaping, as far as addiction potential, is very high. They're both very high, but especially, as I mentioned, in the adolescent brain. It's very high. And like, and the only times I've ever seen marijuana or cannabis withdrawal is people who vape. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I just want to emphasize that it does appear that uh, this is relatable to the illicit cannabis use. And while um, using flavored e-cigarettes certainly can be quite toxic and quite, quite addicting, it does not appear, at least on, in my clinical experience, that it's re- that these e-valley or these pulmonary uh, diseases were related to the flavored e-cigarettes. If there's anything that you could say to mm-hmm. a young person, you know, like 12 or 13 or 15 or however. Your one okay. minute elevator speech? <laughs> well, the only thing that should go in your lungs is air. Yes. And that's, I would, I would say that. Um, once you lose your lungs or once you damage your lungs, the repair mechanisms are such that it may not come back. And this could be a lifelong disability uh, where you cannot exercise, you cannot even walk uh, very easily without becoming short of breath. Lung transplant has been considered in some of these individuals. And it is very sad to see the healthiest people around to be the sickest people in the hospital. And that's, that's my experience with these patients. We certainly have, since September, been recommending people avoid e-cigarette or vaping products, particularly those containing THC, particularly those, you know, um, acquired illicitly. 
but I think these additional studies will round out the scientific story. So does that, can you now say that it's not in um, vaping products containing nicotine? The, the outbreak, this big increase, is, um, is largely explained by the vitamin E acetate phenomenon, but that does not mean that vaping products with THC or other substances are safe, and it doesn't mean that e-cigarettes that are nicotine only are safe. It is not over. There are still new cases coming, and we do think uh, consumers need to be careful, and people need to be vigilant, and public health is still very much focused on this. And this may be a long-term problem for us to make sure that we prevent as much of this serious lung injury as possible. And I think we have to be alert to the idea that there may be new spikes or surges, possibly from other substances that are harmful. This has really been a wake-up call for the public health system and clinicians that there are new threats out there and that consumers really need to be cautious. And when young people are admitted to intensive care units and perhaps damaging their lungs permanently, I think parents and others really need to, to take this seriously. On that note, you've been listening to the Healthy You podcast from North Shore University Health System. I'm Carolyn Starks. If you want more information about vaping, go to northshore.org slash healthy dash you. And thanks.